Greetings, Bible students. We're continuing our study of Romans chapter 9. So please get your Bible and turn to the ninth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 9. Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament. It comes after Acts, right? Uh, the first of the letters. And we're in chapter 9 right now. Now, you'll remember the last time we read together, um, Paul was wrestling with what about the Jewish people who have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah, not accepted that Christ as their Savior? What would happen to them? These are the people of God, and yet they have rejected God's Son. And so that's what he's going to be wrestling with in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And not only are the Jews not accepting, many of the Jews are not accepting him, but many Gentiles are. People who are not the people of God are now accepting Jesus, and people who were the people of God are not accepting him. What does all this mean? God is saving Gentiles. What does it mean about the Jews who don't accept Christ? And he's deeply troubled by this. You can tell when you read, he, he talks about how he you know, would give up his own salvation to save his kindred, meaning the Jews. But he then says, God has the right to make a sovereign choice. He gives us the example last, we looked at last time. Before they were even born, God had chosen Jacob over his twin brother Esau. They're twins, Esau comes out of the, the, the womb first, and yet the secondborn, Jacob, gets the blessing. And so this, you know, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. It's citing God there in Romans chapter 9. What's up? Why God makes this kind of choice? Well, Paul is going to continue, and we need to... Uh, um, Starting at 9, chapter 9, verse 14. I'm going to read out loud and then we'll talk about it. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Megenoito in Greek. Not a, by no, let it never be. You know, the whole idea, you can't even think God could be unjust. God is justice absolute. For he says to Moses, I will have Mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It's God's free choice to be merciful and compassionate. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. It's not about us. It's about God's free choice. God cannot be put in a box. You can't bind God. God can do whatever God wants. And it's God's choice on whom he has mercy, God's choice on whom he has compassion. It's not our place to judge him. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Even Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God. So he, he was playing this part in the great salvation story of Israel. And yet several times it says God hardened his heart. Um, now that's a complicated th theological question. And then frankly, I don't want to get into it. But the point being, it's God's business whom he has mercy on for Paul. It's not a place to judge the absolute, uh, absolutely just God. From verse 19. You will then say to me, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? So he's saying, okay, well, if God willed it this way, then why is it that um, you you say I'm wrong? <laughs> you know, why, why do you condemn me, God, if you're the one who's chosen these things? But Paul goes on and says, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? So he says, Shut your mouth. <laughs> He's saying, you don't have the right to talk back to God, to judge God, to pass judgment on what God does. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder? Or some translations say, will the pot say to the potter? It's a guy who's molding a pot. 
Well, what is molded? Say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of one lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? The potter has the right to do what the potter wants with the clay. God has the right to do with us what he wants. The pot has no right to criticize the potter's choices about what it made it into. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. What if God decided to uh, to make some people for damnation? I'm not saying that's what God did, but Paul says it is like a hypothetical. If God chose to show his power by selecting some for wrath and some for glory, Paul basically says that's God's business, not ours. He wants us to defer to the will of God, to the wisdom of God, to the justice of God, and not go around passing judgment on the one true God. He doesn't literally say what if God did that God did this. He said, what if God did this? Okay. As indeed it says in Hosea, those who were not my people I will call my people, and her who was not beloved I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. So he quotes from the prophet Hosea in the Old Testament, and he's obviously alluding to the Gentiles. Gentiles who were not God's people had become God's people. So, you know, that, that again is saying God will have mercy on whom he has mercy. He wants to have mercy on Gentiles. That's his business. If he did want to condemn the Jews who don't accept Christ, that's his business. Doesn't say he did, but if he wants to. Now, Paul's going to have more to say on this, but he said, it's not our place to judge God. In verse 27, And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord and host had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and, Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So there he's saying that looking at the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, it's clear that only a remnant of Israel is going to be saved. In other words, the Old Testament prophets, is the Old Testament prophet Isaiah at least, implies that many Jews would not be saved. Um, so maybe that's well, that's your answer for why some Jews accepted Jesus, but many, many didn't. Maybe this was prophesied by Isaiah long ago. Paul is deeply troubled by all this, but he's thinking, kind of thinking out loud, I think, about how to understand this. But along the way, we can learn a lot of wise material from Paul's working through this problem. So we're now at uh, verse 30. And in verse 30, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. And Paul said this note over and over and over again. Righteousness before God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is a gracious gift of the living God. God gives salvation through faith to whom he wants, and though the Gentiles for centuries did not pursue righteousness before the one true God, now they have achieved righteousness through the gift of faith from God. He's hit that note over and over and over again, and so that's a given. But that Israel, so I'm now in verse 31, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness <clears throat> pardon me, did not succeed in reaching that law. So Israel had been working 
to try to achieve righteousness by a law obedience, they failed. As he said back in chapter 3, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody can do the law. The Jews who were trying to be made righteous by law obedience failed. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They didn't put their faith in the God who gave the law. They put their faith in their ability to get the law done, to follow it to the letter. And you can't do it because the heart is damaged in such a way that it cannot be 100% faithful 100% of the time. You can't. That's Paul's point again from earlier in the letter. And the Jews who were trying to work their way by doing good works, by following God's law in their lives, rather than putting their trust in God, putting their faith in God, putting their faith in the giver of the law, the ones who put their faith, the Gentiles, get salvation. The ones who try to do it by works don't get there. So the, they, the Jews, uh, have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone for stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. So the stumbling block there is Christ, right? They have not accepted the Messiah. Instead, they tried to be saved by working the law, which they can't succeed in doing. So Christ is the stumbling block there, the skandalon that the Jews can't accept. They don't accept a Messiah who was a nobody from Nazareth in Galilee, a Messiah who just went around teaching and healing and not fighting the Romans, you know, not a great war leader, a Messiah who didn't create an earthly government, a Messiah who got himself crucified by the Romans. All this, they said, nope, that's no Messiah. We're not going to accept that. Stumbling block for them. 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them is that they may be saved. Like I said, Paul is hurt to the quick that his Jewish brethren are not accepting Jesus as the Messiah. His prayer for all Jews is they accept salvation through Christ. Verse 10, chapter 10, verse 2. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So the Jewish people want to please God but they don't know how to do it. They don't know it's faith in God's Son that does it. They think it's following the Mosaic Law that does it. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. God's righteousness is Jesus Christ. Faith in him gives us that righteousness. It bonds us to Christ and makes us accounted righteous in Christ. But they, they, the Jews, he says, sought to establish their own righteousness, their own right relationship to God by following all God's rules, which they couldn't do. They should have put their faith in Christ. Instead, they went the wrong path and they failed. So we're now in chapter 10 at verse 5. We've been at this almost 14 minutes. So I'm going to stop this lecture. We'll continue from 10.5 in the next lecture. God bless.